all right. All right, so, so basically what we're getting down to, we're getting down to the wire for your midterm. All right, so your, your midterm is next week. It's week five. All right, believe it or not. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some process monitoring and scripting, all right? Now remember, there's more than one way to skin the cat on this one. So there's two examples in the shell that you guys can go take a look at, and we'll cover those here in a minute. All right, so how to get a process list. Everyone remembers top from 215 and 217, right? Yeah. Everybody has never heard of H top. all right? So they say in the book it's real time, but I've never seen anything that's real time. So I always say near real time, right? That's just my thing, all right? List of running processes by CPU includes scrolling and mouse support, which is actually really kind of cool. So if you're in a GUI, HTOP is actually really kind of cool. Right? And then what you can do is you can do something called VMstat, provides information about processes, memory, paging, I.O. traps, and CPU. So it gives you a much more better idea of what's going on with your computer. And then, of course, the old standard W, who, or finger provides information about the users that are consuming particular resources on your computer. And then everyone knows PS, PS minus EF. I beat you guys up on that one about how many weeks? 22, 23? All right. Now, other processes you may never have heard of, pgrep and pkill, right? List the PID, the process ID of the processes that you guys are actually using, right? And you can either list them or you can kill them using this. pgrep and pkill are actually kind of cool in a script, right? Especially when you're dealing with processes, right? Free shows the current memory system usage, shows the physical and swap memory. So if you need to see how much free stuff you've got left on your computer, all right, run free. And then MPSTAT, MPSTAT is kind of an interesting one. Shows a bunch of other stuff. So MPSTAT 2.5 shows five sets of data for the global statistics among all the processors. So if you have two processors, it's going to show all the statistics across that whole process, right? So if you type in MPSTAT minus P all 2.5, shows five sets of statistics for all the processes at two second intervals, right? Most no one uses MP stat unless you're like way buried in trying to debug why this thing ain't running right, all right? So just kind of an interesting way of looking at it, all right? So there's different ways of pulling up all your processes lists in, in Linux. Like I said before, there's always more than one way to do the same thing. And the other one is I.O. stat, reports CPU statistics for devices and partitions. And this will include any sample partitions that you've got. And then PMAP reports the physical memory map of the process itself, where it actually resides in memory. So if you're trying to debug a particular memory location, right, or if you think the memory on your computer is going bad, then run a map. Go ahead and run a PMAP of all your processes. You can see how it's throwing things in and out of memory as you go. Does it kind of make sense? Yes, sir. Yes. It shows page file and physical. So it shows them all. It shows everything. No, physical as in like the actual sticks of RAM in your disk. And then the other one is just your page file or your temporary directory or proc directory, wherever it decides to shove stuff up. So you have two scripts to choose from this, t this one, right? And both show different ways of doing the same thing, right? So choose either A or B. You don't have to do A and B, all right? So choose either A or B when you do this. So remember, set the debug, the debug mode. Everyone's getting used to this, all right? Then declare your variables. So what you want to do is you want to set your process, process monitor at base name dollar zero defines a script name, variable, and all the rest of it, right? Where are you going to put your log file? Where it's located? And if it doesn't exist, go ahead and make a new one for me, all right? And then, hey, we're just going to go ahead and take the current TTY, the, the place with our standard input, our terminal, right? And then we're only going to monitor the SSH process. So this only monitors the one process for SSH, right? It will go and check it every second to make sure the SSH is still running. All right, so that's... Um, not really, when you're just doing one process at a time, right? But if you're, like, trying to monitor 10 processes and you're pinging them every second, are you running, are you running, are you running? then you're going to want to have better hardware right, than we've got here. So it depends on scalability and high availability. So if you were Netflix and the Virginia Data Center went down, you could use something similar to this to move all your operations over to LA, the LA Data Center or the Oregon Data Center, depending on who you are and what you're doing. Right? So this has some real world implications. It's almost like a heartbeat on that service. Right? We want to check and make sure it's running because it's critical to us. Right? Then he put a bunch of really cool colors in here. So text red, text green, text yellow, and then 
reset the text so that it goes back to its normal color. Right? So remember when we did coloring with the other command last week? This is another way of doing coloring, text red. All right, text green. It just works on the simple RGB template, right? So red, green, blue, yellow. So if you're colorblind, this is really going to kill you, especially if you're red, green, colorblind. Just remember that I am pink, purple, colorblind. So if you do stuff in pink or purple on the screen, I won't see anything. For real. For real. And that's the reason why I couldn't go be a wiring guy in the Navy was because I couldn't see certain colors of the wire. So it would be really bad if the pink wire blew up the ship. <laughs> there's a reason why they don't let me do certain things all right now we go back to our traps right function exit trap on signal in other words if the thing crashes right remember how a trap works it says oh this crashed or this did something or I typed in exit or hit control c to get out of it if it crashes it's going to send that signal to the computer say all right kill it drop it so like kill minus nine so it looks for any trap that's happening and then log an ending time. So when, it, so when the computer sees that signal of bailout, it will go ahead and log the date timestamp for that process crashing. And it will say terminated. It writes all the stuff to the log file and then drops it out to the screen as well. Right? So it drops it to a log file, drops it to the screen, and then it goes ahead and kills all the functions that are going along with that particular process, right? So if we kill the parent in a parent-child relationship, all the children become orphan processes, right? And they may or may not terminate correctly, right? So he goes back in and makes sure that all the child processes die because we don't want orphans on the planet, right? I know that sounds horrible, but it's really kind of how Linux looks at things, all right? Check to see if the process exits in a normal way. 0, 1, 2, 3, 3, or 15, right? So this would be a normal way if someone comes in, does their thing, goes away. So I use SSH, and then I kill SSH when I log out. That's a normal trap, right? This will see if the process is running. So it goes back through, sees, is it running? PS minus AUX, grep for the process ID, right? And then he drops it off to DevNull. Because if it's not running, he's going to go ahead and try to restart it. So lots of grep in here. And then sets the user output. All right. So if service drops, then do the time state stamping into a log file, going ahead and echo to the screen that the thing crashed. It's not oct active. I'm starting my process all over again. Sleeps for one second. And this is process start. Process has been restarted and drops out to the log file and drops it to the screen and puts some really cool coloring to go along with it. So it kind of makes sense? Getting that blank look, that's really scary. And then loop the process so it always monitors. So this thing will not die. It's sort of like Terminator. It will not die. It will pursue that process to the ends of the earth and will never die until you shut down and reboot the computer. Right? And that's kind of what you want, but you've got to remember your overhead. Right? This is going to have a really small footprint of only a couple K. But if you're, process if you're monitoring hundreds of processes, then it starts adding up after a while. Right? And again, he does all of his good stuff in his log file. He's putting things in nice colors. He's doing all the other things, echoing it all out. Right? Check to see if the process restarted. Right? And if it didn't restart, then go back through and keep on trying to restart this process. Keep on trying. Don't ever give up. All right. So script 4B is a little bit more streamlined. Right? He actually hard codes the target into SSH. Right? So he's just monitoring SSH, but he actually hard codes it. All right? He waits time for 10 seconds before he goes and does anything else. All right? Then he doesn't check for the existence of log file. He just says, here's where you're going to drop it all. So remember, Linux will actually go ahead and create the file for you, but it may not have the right permissions or other things that you need to have running at the same time. Then. See if the script restarted the process successfully. If it failed, give it a zero. Then he does his core monitoring. So he does the same thing as the other guy does, right? For attempting in one, two, three, do. Look at my target. Look at my hard code. Where did I get my process from? What's my process? Right? Then log the date, time, echo. Target's not running. Attempt to kill will be made and try to restart it. Drops out the log file. Drops it out to log file. Service, start, target, and 
kept it as SSH, so it's always going to sit there and try to restart SSH all the time, right? He sleeps for two seconds, and then he pauses it to prevent, because computers will run a lot quicker than the output will, right? The out, it may try to restart hundreds of these, so he gives it a delay in there, right, of two seconds. Right, and then else attempt three, attempt the third time. If it can't come back up on the third attempt, he just drops you a note and says, okay, I can't bring this thing back up as forked. Detect whether the thing failed. He uses the same logic as the other person. Right, PS minus AUX, grep, target. Right, so grep for SSH. See if it's actually in there, if it's running. If it's not, go back, try to restart it. If it is, log date and time that we did and not running after three attempts, then he goes through his process, right? Drops it to the screen, drops it to the log files. So he's basically doing the same core logic as the other person. It's just how we hard-coded it in the variables that are different. So it kind of makes sense? So essentially, you've got the same thing. The logic is the same, but how he programmed up the variables is, is the difference. And then program closing on his core, drops everything. He doesn't do any of the fancy text coloring or anything else, so he makes it all happy in terms of just being text out to the screen and text out to the log file and no worries. So this is really just kind of, here you go, boom. All right? There's no frills to this. It's really just basic. All right. And then what he does too is he goes through and makes sure that his script actually dies. So if it can't do stuff, if it can't do it, then this script will fail and it will go through and kill minus nine its own self. So it will try to kill itself. It's suicide by kill. All right, then he does his traps, core traps, same logic as the other guy. Program closing, exit 0, 1, 2, 3, 15. Monitoring failures, script failure. So he's go through and tries to debug this thing a little bit more on why did we fail, right? It reports a failure in the event, the process does not restart, script failure, all that kind of good things that go along with it. And again, he does that sleep too to make sure there's enough pause in there that the output catches up with the CPU because right, your computer's going to run a lot quicker than the other one. So it kind of makes sense? All right. So same thing for A. Choose A or B. Um, some people are reporting problems with regular SH. So this one was actually set for bin bash. Either one will work, right? In a lot of ways. So, but basically, here's exactly how he does it. And there's all your beautiful text coloring and everything else. He hard codes that process in. It would be kind of interesting, though, is if you turn that into a variable so the user could monitor a process of their own design. So that's one way of modifying this out instead of hard coding it. Right? If you're Netflix, then you probably want to hard code it because you're only going to track four or five services to make sure your service is up and running all the time. And then the same thing, function exit trap, date, time, echo, kill all the functions, drops out all the jobs that he's got cooking, start of main, does his traps, does the search for the process that he's looking for, right? And then very generic text yellow, process is not active, and then does text reset, so it goes back to its normal color. The only problem with yellow, what does yellow imply in America? It implies caution or floor it because that light's about to turn red at the intersection, so I need to go faster to make sure I don't hit the red light. Right? So you kind of want to be culturally sensitive to what these different colors mean. Because if I see yellow, it's uh, just floor it, keep it going until it goes red. Right? And he's saying process died, right? Process not active, and he's calling it yellow. Right? Yeah, you'd want to color that one red. Right? So just so you guys kind of know that there's the r green is go, yellow means floor it to get to the intersection quicker, and red means stop, if you're lucky. Yes? Yes, you can use this to program up and monitor for daemons. You can use this to make sure that your kernel's running right. But it's mostly geared because basically what you want to do is monitor a service. So if you wanted to do your database, if you wanted to do your Apache, if you wanted to do something else that was critical to your business, then yeah, you could change that over. We're just using SSH because SSH is easy, right? It's an on-off process, right? Um, where Apache is, you may end up with a lot of orphan children if the main Apache process dies. And you may not realize it until you're not spawning new things after a while.
Does it kind of make sense? Okay, and then again, he looks for his process. Well, we just want to make sure it's running, if it's good to go. If it's not, then I want to go ahead and restart it. And same thing with 4B, it's just a little bit more convoluted and complex. It's really, really, really well commented, so you guys can follow along the logic a lot. So again, do you really want to make someone go and wait 10 seconds? Is 10 seconds enough time to wait between verifying that service is up and running? Log file, he doesn't check for the existence of the log file straight ahead. So if it doesn't have that log file that it can write to, what ends up happening? Yep. So process monitoring and then the rest of the logic is the same as the other person. So kind of makes sense on how he does this. And again, this one's pretty straightforward. He doesn't do anything fancy with it. He just kind of says, here, boom, here it is. So the logic is the same, but how they handle the log file and the text coloring and the output of the screen is a little bit different. Right? So there's ways of doing really cool stuff. And you can drop in whatever process you want to monitor. If you know you're only going to process, monitor the top 10 things that you do all the time, then do it by top. And that will save you some of the, pr the timing with your script. Right? But if you just want to do it by one process, that's also perfectly valid. So everybody kind of clear on this? All right. So midterm next week. You guys excited? <laughs> all right. All right, so let's wrap this up and then we'll talk about the midterm.